so this is a 71-year-old male. Uh, he's uh, a native of China. He presents with hematemesis um, in the emergency room, um, is stabilized, does not need uh, blood transfusion. He undergoes a uh, EGD, and it shows not really a focal mass, but instead it just shows a loss of gastric folds in the proximal stomach um, involving about 75% of the gastric circumference. Um, the uh, endoscopist appropriately does a series of biopsies, um, even though there's not a discrete mass, and the pathology shows well-differentiated gastric adenocarcinoma. And uh, uh, silver stain is done, and H. pylori organisms are visualized as well. And fortunately, this patient, after getting over his brief hematemesis, does have a good performance status. So I'd like you to just keep this patient in mind as we talk about some of the, uh, the concepts that follow here and how we might apply those to uh, this patient. So I thought I'd just kind of go over um, the initial evaluation for gastric cancer patients because that's really um, pretty important. If you're going to apply neoadjuvant therapy for a patient, you've got to know if it's an appropriate patient. And so this initial evaluation is going to include an endoscopic biopsy. Anybody who's ever going to get neoadjuvant therapy for gastric cancer or, or really any uh, gastrointestinal epithelial tumor has to have a, a biopsy before the medical oncologist will administer the first drop of chemotherapy. Um, the evaluation should also include a contrast-enhanced CT scan, not just of the abdomen and pelvis, but looking for metastatic disease in the chest. Um, <clears throat> it's worth putting in the requisition um, when you talk to the radiologist that you're looking specifically for gastric cancer uh, because this will often um, help them understand whether or not to give oral contrast and how to time the scan based on that oral contrast administration. Obviously, the stomach being a distensible viscera, um, you are going to be most able to demonstrate the gastric mass if the stomach is well distended, in other words, a decompressed stomach, you can't tell the difference between folded mucosa and a mass, and so that's where uh, providing good clinical information to the radiologist helps you get the best information possible back from that CT scan. A CEA level doesn't really help you um, when selecting patients for neoadjuvant therapy, but later down the road, if you're interested in monitoring your patient for recurrence, this can be helpful if the CEA is initially evaluated. Um, nutritional pa parameters are very important to consider. Um, as we know with gastric cancer, much like uh, Dr. Christine talked about for pancreatic cancer, that these malignancies are not diagnosed often until uh, later stages of disease when the patient has already had a decline in their performance status, most notably anemia for the uh, case example that I gave of somebody who's presenting with hematemesis or in weight loss, um, anasarca, all of these things are going to be uh, poor parameters when asking them to heal from a, a, a significant operation. Along those lines, their performance status is going to, uh, to suffer as well. Um, uh, hypoalbuminemia along with that weight loss is a frequent finding. And um, finally, to really complete the, your, your clinical staging, you need to ask for an endoscopic ultrasound. Um, the important components of the endoscopic ultrasound are going to be um, learning more about the T-stage. Uh, this is something that the CT scan cannot tell you, the MRI cannot tell you. Um, it can tell you a T-stage for rectal cancer, but it cannot tell you a T-stage for gastric cancer. And so endoscopic ultrasound or surgery are really the only uh, accurate ways of determining that. And then, of course, your nodal status is going to be an important part of the information that you learn from the um, endoscopic ultrasound. So just to review the, um, the uh, AJCC state T staging for gastric cancer is based on the depth of penetration, not the size of the, of the mucosal lesion, but the depth of the, pen of the penetration. And when we're talking about uh, neoadjuvant therapy, as we'll see on the next slide, really what we're looking for is the pathologist to comment on the relationship of the tumor to the muscularis propria. So uh, T1 uh, lesions do not impinge on the muscularis propria. T2 lesions do. T3 penetrate. And of course, T4 lesions are going to be more advanced with transmural uh, involvement of the gastric wall. Um, for me, um, I frequently use and ask the residents and, uh, to look at NCCN recommendations. Um, with all the different gastrointestinal malignancies that we're seeing in, in clinic on a given day, it's easy to um, sort of 
mix all these together and um, a, a nice way to help remind yourself um, if to make sure that you're kind of thinking along the, the, the right way is to refer to the NCCN guidelines as a free website. Um, you just have to register once. There's no charge for it. It's just nccn.org and it kind of put these, puts these concepts into an algorithmic form. Um, I don't suggest that these are, are, are doctrine, but they certainly help you think along the lines and jog your memory in the right direction. So to look at what their recommendations are for gastric adenocarcinoma, um, somebody who's medically fit and potentially resectable based on CT scan findings and physical exam and history, um, those patients go on to endoscopic ultrasound, and if they have T2 uh, depth of tumor or any lymph node involvement, then those patients um, can uh, have one of three uh, uh, interventions. You'll see that surgery, per perioperative chemotherapy, or perioperative chemoradiation therapy are all listed in NCCN guidelines, and this is a peculiar time, um, a transition time, where we don't really have superiority of either one of these three treatment modalities. And so I'll just kind of work through the perioperative chemotherapy and chemoradiation um, first. So, um, uh, Dr. Christine alluded to some of the benefits of neoadjuvant therapy, and I'll echo those from a gastric cancer perspective. Um, if you're going to uh, administer multiple modalities of therapy for these patients, it, you tend to have better adherence to receive all of them if you start with systemic therapy rather than save it for after the operation. Um, patients who have a declining performance status can have complication afterwards that delays or um, makes them never eligible for that chemotherapy. Um, it, the chemotherapy can serve as what I like to think of as an oncologic stress test. So if the cancer is progressing on neoadjuvant therapy, maybe they just have really poor tumor biology and maybe an operation isn't in their best interest. That also affords you an opportunity to talk with a medical oncologist and perhaps they want to switch the chemotherapy regimen to find something that's more effective. It's going to treat that micrometastatic disease earlier um, in the course of their disease. And um, if you happen to be one of those lucky patients who has a complete pathologic response, that is a very positive prognostic factor, um, which is helpful as well. Um, this has been much more difficult to uh, prove, but um, in the MAGIC trial, one of the, one of the landmark perioperative chemotherapy trials uh, showed an improvement in progressions-free survival, and then a more recent uh, French study called the FNCLCC study um, actually reported an improvement in overall survival. Reporting improvements in overall survival overall for any neoadjuvant therapy is pretty rare, um, but it certainly um, is not inferior. So going again to the NCCN guidelines, what are the regimens that might be useful for patients uh, with gastric cancer? The mainstay is going to be ECF, which is a combination of epirubicin, cisplatin, and, five, uh, and 5 fu uh, these are all infusional agents. Um, they usually, uh, the, the oncologist usually will request a chemotherapy port at the time um, if you're going to start this. And there are significant toxicities depending on which trial you look at, um, about a 30% of grade 3 or grade 4 toxicities. Um, so these are not um, um, kind of walks in the park. Uh, you have to have an oncologist who's committed to that patient, a patient obviously who's committed to the process. Uh, on the flip side here, if you look at perioperative chemoradiotherapy, um, typically it's only two agents, because when you combine the chemotherapy with radiation therapy, that introduces a whole new set of toxicities. Again, a, a frail patient is just not able to uh, typically tolerate uh, triple uh, therapy, chemotherapy with uh, radiation. So uh, these are not part of NCCN guidelines, but um, uh, the way that I approach gastric cancer patients with neoadjuvant therapy. And um, you can sort of pick and choose um, after you kind of um, uh, see what I've proposed here. So I like to perform a staging laparoscopy for all patients who I'm considering for neoadjuvant therapy. Um, there is uh, occult micrometastatic disease that it's not always seen on the CT scan, 
not always seen on the EUS, and I like to know if I'm starting out with a stage four patient or if I'm really dealing with an advanced stage three patient. Um, chemotherapy is going to take away some of those tiny peritoneal deposits that you can't see on the CT scan, but you can only see when you do the laparoscope. And I think the patients who have stage four disease are forever going to perform like stage four patients. And I don't think resection is appropriate for those patients. And so that's why I want to complete that staging with a laparoscopy for all patients. It gives you also the opportunity at the time of laparoscopy to place that chemotherapy port and to consider placing a feeding tube, a feeding J-tube, if they come in particularly uh, frail. Then um, you want to repeat those CT scans after the neoadjuvant therapy is to complete to make sure that you've achieved what you set out to do with the neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And then lastly, I'll just um, plant in your head to stay tuned in the next couple of years for additional results from a randomized trial that's right now just enrolling in Australia and New Zealand, which is head-to-head -head comparing perioperative chemotherapy alone to perioperative chemoradiotherapy. This is a continual debate of how to um, treat these patients, whether just to give them chemotherapy upfront or chemoradiation upfront before surgery, and this trial will finally put some of that uh, to rest. So I'll flip back to our case presentation, our 71-year-old Asian male. Um, so he didn't have any metastasis on a CT scan of the chest, abdomen, pelvis. He had a good CT, he had a good performance status. On EUS, he had a T3N0 lesion. He was treated for his H. pylori infection, something not to overlook. Um, he uh, had a robust albumin uh, level. I took him to the operating room. He had a negative staging laparoscopy. I placed the chemotherapy port, being that his albumin was robust. He didn't need a feeding tube. He got three cycles of ECF uh, chemotherapy down in Dothan. Um, he tolerated this very well. After his neoadjuvant chemotherapy, that gastric thickening improved. I took him to the operating room um, and started with an EGD. He had diffuse proximal gastric thickening. Again, no mucosal mass can often be misleading. He needed a total gastrectomy with a Roux and Y um, esophago gastrostomy placed a feeding tube, went uh, home on post-op day six. His final pathology is what I'd like to bring your attention to. These neoadjuvant regimens work well for some people, and you saw um, that I mentioned 11 to 26 percent chance of a complete pathologic response. Not everybody will see that kind of great result. This patient still, after good um, neoadjuvant therapy, still had a 5.7 centimeter gastric cancer. And even though the EUS showed N0 disease, surgically he had one out of 15 nodes after chemotherapy. So these are certainly still patients that you have to do a really good operation with because chemotherapy is not um, a bailout uh, for, for quality surgery. And so he's been referred back to medical oncology to complete. It's not just neoadjuvant therapy before surgery. You have to complete three more cycles of chemotherapy after to really adhere to um, the way the trials were constructed. So um, with that, I'll just kind of reinforce the take-home points that um, uh, I'd encourage you to think about endoscopic ultrasound for all gastric adenocarcinoma patients, to consider neoadjuvant therapy for patients with T2 or greater disease or with N1 disease. Um, I think you should consider staging laparoscopy for all patients who are going to start neoadjuvant therapy and um, that perioperative chemotherapy versus surgery improves uh, a number of survival, survival parameters. And with that, I'll wrap things up, and I um, appreciate your attention. If you're interested in some of those landmark trials, I'll leave these uh, displayed for a few seconds, and I think the slides are being provided to everybody. You're welcome to look these up um, or email me. I'd be happy to send you the PDFs.